something double digit thousand <laughs> His name is Biggie, and he's just kind of a lurker. But uh, he does move every now and then. There he is. He, he is a lurker. <laughs> he just wants to be an eavesdropper because uh, sometimes three's a crowd. So, you know, we do what we got to do. Good. Uh, hey, and then, uh, yeah, sorry there was uh, some issues with trying to get things over to you on the forum. Not a big deal. It's, it, never, uh, it never showed up, did it? But it, it's got, got a lot of No, it, it didn't, but I, I got to go in and see, make sure I got all the settings on that right. Um, because I did actually see some other ones come in today, but I, I don't, I can fill it out. It's not a big deal. I, it's, it's, I, I, I get the excuse. I'm going to be 65 April 8th. So I kind of missed that window of being proficient with the, uh, <laughs> with you, the computer. You got those offensive lineman hands too. That can't be easy to type. Yeah. yeah. No, I, it's not. It's like, <laughs> I think we're the last generation that dabbled in both. Like I know. The old school and the technology. Yeah, see, we're like early 40s, so we have a little bit of the analog age, yeah. a little bit of the digital age. So we can still appreciate yesteryear and also kind yeah. of understand technology. Like, I can open a PDF, so I'm, <laughs> I'm okay. What's it, what is a PDF? I, you know, I don't really know what it stands for, but I know how to – damn it, why'd you put me on the spot like that? <laughs> yeah, that is a good question. I have no idea what it is either. <laughs> Uh, it's pretty darn fancy, is what it is. Oh, there you go. Uh, you, you guys are in West Virginia. Yeah, West by God, Virginia, just outside of Charleston, a little bit. I, my son went to Morgantown. Okay, yeah. I mean, yeah. we we go to Morgantown for all our you know mountaineer stuff we like to go do, and uh, it wasn't a good year for Actually, basketball. West Virginia. Yeah, That's it, the flying WV always got to rep that. Sure. But we'll just keep rolling, man. We got uh, Steve Wright uh, joining us. And Steve is, I don't know, you remember those Dos Equis commercials where it was like the most interesting man oh, yeah, in the yeah, world? Yeah. Like, I feel like Steve could attest to that a little bit. Uh, not only did he play in the NFL a long time, but for a brief moment, he was the man from Northern Iowa. And then this guy named Kurt Warner came along and probably overshadows that. Does that, yeah. does that, does that give you sour yeah. grapes at all? Not at all. Not at all. I mean, how about bagging groceries to MVP is like, wow, so cool. I've never met him. What? I just uh, I just got a call, uh, an email this morning. I'm going to go back from the head football coach there. I'm going to go back at, to homecoming. I've been back there, I don't think, since I graduated. Um, going back there to be an honorary captain and speak to the football team. Super jacked about that. And it's also, too, I'll oh, pump in this thing every place I can. Yeah, we're well, we're we're gonna talk about the book for sure, but I, I, I'm gonna say Northern Iowa needs to do a better job getting their alumni together. Like they should be like a picture of you blocking for Kurt Warner even now. Oh, you know, just let's just make that happen. Like, let's recruit Northern Iowa. Uh well, which, and- which, what's really cool is just writing this book, I'm having people come out of the woodwork and I'm finding people, either on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or something. Just got back in touch with a guy named Kelly Ellis who was our running back and we were playing Western Illinois and he ran for 386 yards. That's a lot. (laughs) Besides his punt returning and kick returning. And then uh, he held that for about seven years. And I just talked to him just the other day, Ladanian Thomas, I guess, Tomlinson. Tomlinson. Yeah. 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 Tomlinson. Yeah. I guess he beat it about seven years later. But that was pretty cool. The old Northern Iowa had a dude run for 386 yards. You know, even if that's not like the record anymore, that's still a pretty cool brag. Just to be like, that's you know, okay. one time I ran for almost 400 yards in college. Just, just saying one game, not the year. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's what I'd feel. So does it bother you that offensive linemen don't get stats the same way? Like, you know, I mean, it's just really more about the eye test than anything else. Cause you, you played uh tackle, correct? Yeah. No, it's just uh, to, to get in there and bloody your nose up and have some fun pushing people around with your four other buddies, you know. Have have Marcus come by and take someone's rib cage out while I'm locked up on them. And it's just the it's the it's the camaraderie and getting paid well, you know. But <laughs> no, it's uh never had the you know, the focus on us and never really missed it, you know, as long as we scored. I mean, it's, it's, it's bittersweet because you have the, the, the unsung heroes of the game, essentially, because if you have a good line on either side, you're going to control the tempo. Oh, absolutely. Control the it's, game, it's, control the trenches. 
And check out how the the pay scale has gone now. You know, uh, uh, what's his uh, Henry? Uh, Henry just signed for sixteen million for two years. What's his name? And the big running back, uh, Derek um, Henry. You talking about for Baltimore? Derek, Derek, Derek yeah. Henry. And the linemen are getting huge bucks. The I tackle. just I just saw this guard for the Eagles got paid, like got a really big contract, and then they showed like his first big purchase. He just went out and bought a riding mower. That was it. Oh, I saw I saw that. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was See, the cool. offensive linemen are getting love now. Yeah, it's, it shows how the game has changed. You've got to have the best quarterback, and then you've got to have the best guys protecting them. Mm. So with, with, with all receivers help too. With all with all flattery, you look like you're in really good shape, and you don't look like you're carrying a lot of weight. How much did you weigh at your? Oh, look at the gun show, baby! Oh, oh easy, easy. <laughs> I'm wearing long sleeves, so you can't see mine. Um, <laughs> so, you're, 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 yeah, you're out here in Malibu, man. That's just uh, my wife and I. Just you know, we just uh, it all is, it's all controlled by the the pie hole. That's um, it. You're not wrong. Just eat it, eat pretty well. I, I don't really drink. It's not that I, I had a problem. I just, you know, kind of got away. Anything that goes in my pie hole has got to have some nutritional value. That is uh, the yeah, hardest just, discipline. That's the hardest discipline in this country anyway. Yeah, and it, but it, it becomes like anything else. What, at 30 days or something, it becomes a habit. I also, too, this is going to knock you over. I stop eating at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, maybe 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Start at 6 o'clock and through eating at 2 or 3. So how long do you fast after eating? When do you finally eat? Well, from, 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 you know, two or three o'clock in the afternoon until like six o'clock the next morning. That's uh, and that's usually, that's usually just a coffee. And then we get in the pool or get up in the ocean and do something, swim or get on the sand and run. I, I work out with about five other guys three days a week in the guy's garage. He's got everything. And that's, you know, we're just yucking it up, but man, we push each other. There's a, there's an app called Labada Tabata. And it just keeps you moving. So you can set it for on for 30 seconds, 15 seconds rest, whatever, on for an hour or whatever it is. And we just go with that and put on some reggae and and, <laughs> and get jamming, man. <laughs> a little buffalo soldier. You know, oh, yeah. something like it. I, yeah. I tell you what, you make Malibu sound just horrible. Like I, it sounds like the worst place on the planet. No one ever wants to go. No, I'm just kidding. It's uh, you know, something it's it has it definitely has its, its pluses and minuses. It's uh, the whole uh, city is like twenty seven miles long, and it's only maybe three or five miles wide. And it's all on Coast Highway. You never see anybody on bicycle. I've never walked out of my place to go anywhere. I've never gotten out of my bicycle to go anywhere. You get in your car. You know, it's California is you know just a car culture, but also too. I mean, you get killed if you're out there on. Uh, so like we've had 53 people killed in you know car accidents and everything on Coast Highway. It's just a wicked road. Mm. Um, so people it's flying a, through there. Is that what it is? So I guess what, I, what I'm getting at is you know you just drive over your buddies, you do your thing, you drive home, you drive get groceries, you drive back. It's it's I, I I miss getting on a bike and throwing a backpack and throwing some stuff in there or walking or, but I'm not complaining. We love we live right on a surf point here. And I'm a stand-up paddle surfer. So is my wife. I know uh, my buddy Greg here has uh, a lot of visions of going to Fiji one day. And and you you have uh, paddle surfed in Fiji, correct? Yeah, yeah. There's a great surfer who's got a surf camp there, um, Dave Kalama. He's actually the one that came up with, I guess, and kind of brought uh, stand-up paddle surfing to the to the to the crowds and uh he puts a camp on down in Fiji in, a, in an island called Namotu and it's uh, all around the island are just different breaks and so if the swell's coming from one way you'll go over there if it's hitting the next day on something else and do do some I did some, my first free diving there this year got down to 50 feet oh wow uh, yeah it's uh it's a lot of fun it's it's warm it's tropical the water's you know bizarrely clean and clear and yeah it's it's a little bit of heaven that's that's my wife and i you know down in that area down in the south pacific and fiji and all that is uh that's 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 where i could see us you know going many more times before i before i drop
Heck yeah, man. So it, it's not like uh, one of those places that you'll see influencers or social media personalities. And then you get there and you're like, oh, well, it's actually as advertised. Yeah, it's, it's probably maybe two football fields long and a football field wide. And there, there's, I think, like 12 huts on it. And you sleep in just kind of a okay, shitty hut. But the whole thing is, no, you, you never hang around there. They feed you like a beast. I mean, it's just endless fish, um, different kinds of fish. So you're literally living on a lot of protein and vegetables and fruit and everything. And then, man, you're just out surfing all the time. How long is that flight to get there? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a long one. It's You take Fiji Air. Um, it's like uh, 13, 12, 13 hours. Ah. Straight shot. It's easy. It's worth it. When you get out, when you get when the door opens up and you smell this warm tropical air just blast you. It's like Yeah, we're in paradise. You go, Time you to go. go. You give a little shaka. <laughs> uh so you know, you you uh you know, we're giving you the moniker most interesting man in the world. So I, I want to go through some of the stuff that you know we've discovered about you and definitely want to get to the book because that that's huge. But, you know, obviously the football career is what got you kind of moving and you were undrafted, much like Kurt Warner. I'm I'm trying to put respect on your name. We're putting you on the same level here. Okay, yeah. And uh, you, you, what was that process like? You didn't get drafted. How'd you get into the league and, and kind of take us through like the, the career a little bit? Yeah. So I, my senior year uh, in college, I was getting letters from the Cowboys and the Browns and a few other teams. And when it came around to it, I, I sprained my ankle the last couple of games, my senior year. So I really kind of sh shot myself in the foot. Um, I was playing tight end. And so watched the draft come and go with all my buddies, got pretty schnockered, uh, just watch, just watching that and went home and there's three guys on my patio, just sitting there shooting the shit. And I walk up and they're all from different teams. Oh wow! And I was just like, please let one of them be from the Cowboys. <laughs> and sure enough, it was this. It was a scout from the Cowboys, and I said, "I'm going with you." He said, "Get in my car. Uh, <laughs> try to freshen up a little bit." I got this all in my book, the whole story. So I'll try to speed through it a little bit faster. But um, signed with the Cowboys. Um, got to Dallas uh, for the first training camp, and there was 120 free agents they signed. And long story short, three of us made it. Oh wow, that, that's a uh, that's a that's got to be intimidating to walk up on that. Yeah, it 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 is. But I really try to describe it in my book that I don't know where this came from from me, and this is what I'm, my message is going to be to the Northern Iowa, the Panthers, when I go back to speak to them, is stay in the moment. Don't one thing that I got was rooming with five other guys at training camp. My my rookie, there were six rookies, all free agents, sitting in a room sleeping and these guys were always talking about like the the 49ers scrimmage in two weeks and how you know they really got to shine and everything else and or that you know we're, we're going against the rams you know next weekend and i was just like wow like 120 guys over the course of three weeks it, 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 there was a all the names next to the scale every day we'd weigh and every day there was more black lines through names and i knew i knew that i was not going to see the light of day tomorrow that i was going to be have the coach have the guy come in and say steve get your playbook and go see coach landry but it didn't happen to me it kept happening to everybody else and i all i could think about was just and i didn't really realize it until i really started writing this book that what kept me in in the mix is all i was going to do was be the best i could the next morning because I knew we we're doing a lot of run blocking in the morning. So my whole mind was on run blocking. It was in the afternoon when we we're doing pass blocking and everything else and doing different sleds, you know, the seven man sled or whatever it was. So I just focused all on that, knowing that I, I probably get cut by lunchtime and, you know, not make it back. So it was, I think it was just staying in the moment. Um, and giving it the, the best you can. And that's what I'm going to tell these guys, you know, when I go to see them too, is man, just focus everything on this homecoming game. Don't focus on the homecoming party afterwards. But when you get to that party afterwards, be 100% there and focused on that and have a freaking amazing time. But when you're here, bring it all right here. Just connect and, and you know, do the, do the, just stay present is, is my, one of my bigger messages. 
I think that's apt, not just for football, but for many things. But yeah. how long how long was that process uh, between the time you got there versus uh, – I, I, I mean, I'm not familiar about, with how it was back in the – Yeah, back 70s. then it was – I think it was about six weeks. And then uh, I got I got picked as, as one of the team members and just had a – so that also that same year where I knew I wasn't going to make it, I was, I was sleeping in this room with defensive backs and everything else, but – that year, their number one and their number three draft picks were offensive linemen. Howard Richards, who went on to have a great career, and the third third round draft pick was Glenn Titansor. And so we, we were the three um, linemen making the the Cowboys in '81. So it was, uh, you know, I got I got a lot of great stories. We were blocking for Dorsett my rookie year. Um, yeah, they're, they're 99 yard run. Right? There might be a particular play that stands out. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And so what, what it, it didn't, it, it took me a long time. It hit me way later, just realizing this, that I was on the kickoff return team. Um, we fumbled the ball. I'm coming off the field. I'm on the kickoff return team. I'm running off the field. And my offensive line coach pushes me back out and tells me to take the spot. He didn't tell the number one and number three draft pick, both offensive guards, and, and they have both guard and tackle, just like me. I was like, wow, they shoved another free, you know, just this cheap free agent back out there again. And so I was I was definitely getting under their skin, and I knew I was a scrapper and could play. So that, that really made me proud. But, yeah, then getting in there and blocking for Tony Dorsett. And the cool thing about that is – Four years earlier, I'm sitting in the stands before the Metrodome was built. It was freezing. We I grew up going to those Vikings games and watching the Purple People Eaters when I was, you know, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh grade. So four years earlier, I'm whatever, six, sixteen, I'm probably 17 years old, junior in high school, watching Drew Pearson catch the uh the Hail Mary. Yeah, the first he Hail Mary. Yeah. He caught the Hail Mary, and now four years later, I'm in the freaking huddle with him, and we're slapping five. And <laughs> I'm the youngest. I'm the youngest guy in the huddle. And my parents are, I wish I thought, with the worst seats, right behind the goalpost, about three rows up. The, and we we huddled up in the back of the end zone for this play. You know, I was shitting on myself that holy crap, they called the play right over right over me in the center. And I was like, holy crap, what are you doing? You know, but they just wanted to give get get a few yards. You're just trying to get breathing room and then look what happens. Yeah. yeah. I would have came off the side off to the sideline, been like, see, coach, is what happens when you keep me in. I think I was throwing up. I was just like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Mm. So you, you ended up, uh, you know, playing for more than just the Cowboys. So do you have uh, – did the Cowboys remain like that team you held in high prestige? Uh, because you they, wanted to go there. but They, they, did, they did through the Colt years because I went from the best to, you know, one of the worst, uh, playing for Frank Cush, who was just an absolute dickhead. Uh, <laughs> absolute dickhead. It was just uh, – I got a lot of stories about him in the book and – but uh, had a lot of great guys. We sucked as a team, but we were really tight. Chris Hinton, um, who I'm still in touch with today, and Guy Ben Ut, and quite a few other players. We were a really tight team, but we sucked. It was all the coaching, but um, <laughs> I mean, clearly, clearly. But then, but then, once I got out to the Raiders, yeah. So then, you know, I, I jumped leagues. I went to the USFL because the Colts were the lowest paying team in the NFL. And so I went to uh, the USFL and we played in uh, played one year. We were in the championship game and lost that, and the league folded. And our head coach Charlie Sumner had been the defensive coordinator for the Raiders for the previous ten years. So they said, you know, once a Raider, always a Raider. I brought him back as the defensive coordinator, and he brought myself and I think Anthony Carter back, and ended up just sticking around and scrapping through it and. Yeah, so you know, I, I'm I'm not disappointing myself in doing it, but that was the strike year. Ah, oh. so they're walking the picket line with everybody, and everybody's disappearing. So I go over to my my parents in Arizona after about 25 days of walking the picket line, and you know, all the star guys had disappeared, and I'm going like, oh my God, I don't need this either. You know, this thing will settle out and toss my toss my uh, stick with my you know strike. Went over to my parents' house, and that night I was having dinner, and 
the Raiders called and said, hey, Al Davis wants you back here tomorrow morning. And he's going to jack you up 25%. And he's going to guarantee this, boom, boom, boom. And I said, okay, great. That's awesome. But I, I'm not tonight. I'm not going to negotiate anything tonight. I'm having dinner with my parents. Hung up. Two minutes later, calls back. Oh, Steve, he's really pissed. He's going <laughs> to jam it up to this, and he's going to guarantee that. And I said, beautiful. Al Locus out. And I said, Al, thank you very much, but I will talk to you tomorrow. And hung up. He called again, and he said, hey, Steve, this is it. He's guaranteeing 100% of the contract, and he's jacking it up to this. But you got to be at practice in the morning. And I said, fuck, I'll be there. <laughs> so you weren't even really negotiating. You were just like, we'll talk tomorrow. But he was reading it like, I'll raise mistakes until it was, that was amazing. It was the most crazy negotiations. I really was not negotiating. He thought I was the toughest negotiator. <laughs> that's great. That's, a, that's amazing. So I ended up getting over to the Raiders and I pull into the lot and Mike Haynes and some other guys are back out in the picket line because as Ken was getting close to everything was getting ready to break in the league. And they're kind of looking at me like, you know, you scab. And so I, I just said, you know, I, by this time, when you get traded, you know, as my rookie year, well, you're just, you realize you're a piece of meat. You're just a number. So then, you know, they, they, Colts, I'm starting for them. They're not going to pay me. And it's like, okay, you got to just look out for yourself. So after 30 days of sitting on the strike or whatever it was, I came through in the morning. And then that afternoon, before this afternoon practice, the league just, the whole league, went on off strike they they everybody came through so i could have fought i could have not dealt with that and come back like everybody else did but i sat at home for one night and negotiated a monster great contract that you know better than i should have ever had <laughs> so i was just it was just another lucky thing for me and my my book is full of so many of those kind of stories did you ever think about becoming an agent after that skill? I mean, that was amazing. They move over, Scott Boris. Yeah. No, no, it's uh, it was it was just it was just dumb luck, man. It was because uh, I was all ready to talk to him and I was kind of fired up, but I was like, man, you could talk to me over the last twenty eight days. They're standing up in the window, Al Davis just standing there like this, just looking at us, and I'm going like, I'm new guy on the team, and I'm standing out there, you know, fuck you, pay us. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> he did. Yeah. Uh, so I, I gotta, I gotta ask, uh, just because you played in the USFL, and I, you know, I don't remember it that well because I was so young. Sure. How different was the NFL versus the USFL back in the day? Like when you went from one to the other? Yeah, it was really kind of a trip because when I was with the Cowboys, one of the first guys they ever played against was Jack Youngblood. You know, okay. and he just and I had two two holding calls my rookie year against against the Rams and him for you know just hanging on for my dear life and I played <laughs> against some you know some all pro guys um, quite a bit nothing like later in my career in the nineties or something when every weekend there's a Pro Bowl or a future Hall of Fame or you're just like oh so when I got to the USFL I had Reggie White there um, Reggie White and. There was there was some good players, but you know you have you have you know two tough matches a year, you know everybody else was you know fairly soft, gotcha. uh, just just not as good as just not as good quality of of players, and especially week in and week out like like you do when you get to the NFL. And I go from Neil Smith to Bruce Smith to you know Reggie to Lawrence Taylor to you know it's just like. Uh, you're ready, that just, you're ready that just sounds you're ready for vacation at Fiji. Yeah. <laughs> uh do you do you have like a murderer's row of like the worst ones to line up? Like who if you have like one or two, no, you're let's, just like let's pick four. Yeah, go yeah, Mount four. Rushmore of the the worst, uh maybe not the best player, but the ones you just hated lining up against. Neil Smith, number one. Because I had I had him. I had him whatever. I think 14. Neil Smith is criminally underrated. He was a phenomenal defensive he player. Was. He was awesome. And we just didn't like each other and he was good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Bruce, Bruce Smith is, is better than him by far. Oh yeah. Bruce, Bruce, Bruce was and not that Neil was, you know, didn't have the smarts he did, but Bruce just knew how to set things up. And it's like Reggie knew how to set things up. Um, Reggie. And then, uh, you know, then against Lawrence Taylor, 
Yeah, that's a hell of a Mount Rushmore for me. I got got thrown over on the left side for that game. You know, here's a funny story. So I'm playing right tackle. The left tackle went down. I went practice or something. So I got moved over for my first time really playing left tackle. And we were playing in the Meadowlands. And I knew I watched so much film on him. Knew he was fast and strong and everything else. But, you know, it's always it takes that first collision to really understand each other. And the Raiders always do a 10, 10 step drop, 12 step drop. And, you know, this is the first play of the game. Burline's back there, you know, 13 yards or something like that. And we're <laughs> I'm wrestling with, uh, I got Lawrence Taylor. He's running up field and then he just turned on me and stuck his head right in the middle of my chest. And there's no way I could have ran backwards farther. I was, just <laughs> a, bu- I was, a, I was a bug on his windshield. And the only thing that slowed me down was running over Burline with the ball. And I'm laying on the ground. Burline's underneath me. I'm in the middle and Lawrence is on top of him right here in for a long fucking day. <laughs> oh. It's just like the first play, I, the game had been, I'd been going for about 12 seconds and I was already. But I ended up, <laughs> so I finally realized, you know, his strength and his speed and everything else. I ended up having a great game. I but, mean, you, you got to acclimate quick in that situation. That's, you, that's you sure do. It's and that's what uh, um, Mike Ditka told me. It's like my rookie year. I, I called him Wisdom Walks um, when I was a rookie. Some for some reason he was my special teams coach, and he just throw his arm up around my neck when you know in training camp. And so I felt pretty good about that, but I was so frustrated. You know, with maybe just, you know, the offensive line coach screaming at me or something. And he'd just throw out a little simple something like, hey, he's driving you crazy because he's yelling at you. And I said, yeah. He goes, you start to worry if he stops yelling. Huh. Go, Whoa. You know, he cares, you know. And then, you know, get, getting getting my ass thick as hell. I mean, you're going to get your ass kicked today. Deal with it. Figure it out fast. You're only as good as your last play. So you better get it figured out or you're going to be gone. So it's exactly like you're saying. It's uh, you got to figure it out fast. Yeah. So I, you, I said earlier, you look like you're in tremendous shape. But as far as playing all those years, do you have any anything like wearing you out, nagging injuries, or did you pretty I, much I, make it out pretty good? Yeah, you know, I tore my left shoulder in uh, um, Kansas City in '90 and had the whole thing repaired. Um, and but it's just that's been a long time. It's been whatever 35 years or something. Um, I'm going to get this thing redone in uh, November, but I just, I just had my first real big operation. I had a, I got a new knee 11 weeks ago, mm-hmm. brand That's, new knee with, with metal parts and everything else. It's, it's, it's trippy. They can rebuild you. Um, <laughs> um, I, I'll tell you what, how much, uh, you still got uh, time for us. Can we take a quick break and come back? Take it. Take and come back. Well, wait a minute. All right. Hold on. Oh, oh. There, there's my new knee. I can't see it. It's got the back. Oh, wait a minute. There it is. Yeah, that is a bionic knee for sure. Nice. Isn't that something? That's uh I, I'm sure the shoulder surgery probably wasn't as refined as uh it, no, it will be this, 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 this next one will be, I hope. Uh but yeah, we're gonna take take a bathroom break. I want to definitely talk about the book. We haven't even touched on Survivor yet because uh I yeah, you know, I'm not really a fan of the show, so I got questions and then uh we'll kind of wrap it up from there. So uh we'll be back in a few. I'll text you in a minute. Hey, hello there he is hey 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 i gotta ask you so sorry about that no no you're good are, are you a baseball fan at all it is opening day after all no nah all right, we'll all right greg is gonna be upset you can see he's wearing his braves gear he he's already done with you oh yeah i'm sorry i just uh, you know it was it was it was football all the time it was it was football and then uh I, I don't even watch any football anymore. I think the game has just changed. It's just, you know, now that – how about that new kickoff? It's yeah. Just like, I mean, I, I, I'm i okay with it only because it's gotten to the point with the way it's been where everything's sure. a touchback, you know, so at least give me something. It, it better better than it was. But, you know, got to hate to sound like an old guy, but, man, not you know, back when I was, you know. Get off my lawn. Just, just pounding on each other. Yeah. Wow. So like, I never got into baseball. They they've had more rules, you know, to protect the quarterback in recent times, and I feel like there's more quarterback injuries than ever before, despite the new rules. So it's yeah. like you can't make it make sense. 
Yeah, I I don't know. I I don't watch I, like this last year. I watched three games. I watched both the championship game and the Super Bowl, and that was it. And all three of those were amazing. Yeah, I mean their product is at an all time high. It's it's super yeah. exciting yeah. for almost yeah. every fan. But every it's they do such a good job with parody. Like we we're yeah. talking about baseball being they open really today. There, there, there are teams today in Major League Baseball that know they have no shot at the playoffs. But mm -hmm. in the NFL, like anything can happen. And uh, like you're right. talking about the injuries, like it, you, you can have that Look stuff. Look at the Texans everything. this year. Yeah, like the Houston Texans. Like they, I know you don't follow, but like nobody thought they'd make the playoffs. I mean, they they yeah. were expected to win like four games. Yeah, but it's <laughs> it, it's great about the parity. But I think what it is. This is just my opinion. I look at these defenders now. They're faster, bigger, stronger than they've ever been. And yep. when you're getting hit by people like that, there's consequences. And when you look at all the rule changes they've done to try to make it easier on the offenses, you know, it's they're still like if you're scoring 25 points a game, that's on the upper half, you know. So, I mean, it's the defense is just they're so athletic now. I, I agree. I mean, everybody is just their 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 how they work out is so much better than what I was exposed to. I was just talking to a buddy about it. You know, it's just all the newfangled cool things for for like alignment, just pushing and driving different things. I had my girlfriend sitting in the front seat of my car with it in neutral, pushing around the parking lot. Yeah, but you that know? builds character. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. But I would have loved to have had the tools that these guys have now. Yeah, they're training like the Rocky uh, montage. Yeah, man. Rocky IV, you're over in Russia. I would have loved it. I would have loved it. <laughs> I don't know. Just don't be one of those. You're not a CrossFit guy, are you? I'm not. Okay, no. good. Right, no, that, I, that... I, would, I would have been. I, I would have been I'd probably if I was 30 years old. But right now, I get into soft sand and I run a straight, slow line. <laughs> that's that's nothing wrong with that. Your joints probably appreciate that more than CrossFit. Yeah. My joints love it. <laughs> so let's talk about this book because I'm always curious when people go to write a book, like what, what gets you started? What makes you think like, Hey, I'm going to write a book. And I think people are going to read this. Now I can tell you from talking to you for a half hour already, I, I want to read it, but like what yeah. gave, what gave you the confidence to do it? it? It's a good point. A lot of great questions in there. Um, I, didn't really care how much people wanted to read it. I, I knew I wasn't going to have a number one bestseller or anything, but it was going to be better than, than I hadn't been keeping a journal or a diary, but I had so many, so many stories in my head. I thought, well, why not just start scribbling some of them down and kind of go in a somewhat of a linear, you know, starting with, gosh, I got funny stories when I was, you know, first playing Pop Warner football with the Wildcats in fourth grade and all my buddies. And then we all did this. And well, then we also raised a bunch of hell and got in a bunch of trouble. So those are kind of fun stories, too. And all my buddies, nobody else has written about them. So all right, the wait, 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 real quick. So what what type of trouble does a youngin get in from where? And where, where did you grow up? Were you in Minnesota? In, in Minneapolis. OK, so what, what but, type you know, of what type of trouble are you getting into? And and I also have another Minneapolis question after your answer. Yeah, just uh, a bunch of us would sleep out in the fort. We're in what seventh, eighth grade, something like that, sleeping out in the fort, and uh, we'd go out and run all night at the, It was right on the on, off this country club that my parents belonged to, and we would go out there and and lock the sprinklers in place and go slide and, and lock them on the green and, <laughs> and slide across the green all night, and then go up and every once in a while take the break into the, the the caddy shack and the 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 golf cart shack and take some of these golf carts out and and <laughs> them on the golf course show it's just stupid stupid stuff not thinking beyond the end of your nose um and then yeah just uh that and and, and much more but um can you imagine me in the groundskeeper and you come out and these damn kids are like doing slick and slide down the green and golf yeah. carts everywhere on the it's, green it's, it's, it's fun i got uh, some fun stories now so then just kind of went on to other stories um of things that kind of made me who i am how i learned about things how you know as you're a kid no one really thinks you're paying attention but it, you just really realize that you know, I was paying attention, you know, just how we belong to this country club. And I write about, you know, just the prejudice of watching, you know, white golfer friends of my parents 
treat some black guy or Hispanic guy crummy, you know, at the, at the, at the shack or something, and then come up and just be all nice to them. And I just like, this, that's, that's, that doesn't make sense. It's kind of weird, but you're learning and learning about what I call good mentors and bad mentors. Oh yeah. Good mentors that helped me and a lot of bad mentors helped me too. Like, I don't want to be like that dude, you know? Uh, and yeah, and it's just kind of on to football and what got me there, my staying present. So it was just more or less to kind of share about how I did it. Uh, when opportunities open up, charge. If you're a young person, charge through them. It might not work, but if it even feels good in your gut, the way I think it, you know, we've spent a million years um, making that work for us. Fight, fight or flight and if there's an opportunity charge at it don't get this involved with like well so a lot of stories of, of like when i was asked to uh if i want to try for survivor i had never seen the show i didn't know anything about it i ran into the casting director they asked me if i wanted to try out i could have said well let me call you tomorrow i'm done at fox that Studio. worked before <laughs> that worked really well once before yeah, and it's like, I, you know, I would never get back in touch with them. I said, sure. And two months later, I'm landing in Nicaragua for, you know, on national TV and Survivor. And it was just so my thing is just always saying yes. And I wanted to get that out to people. Um, if it sounds good, do it. You know, it's if you live this life once and you don't know how long it's going to be. And if you got an opportunity charge. You, uh, you set the table for a few things there, but the the. First thing is I, the advice you're giving young people. Like, I, I think that's incredible, right? Because for a couple of reasons, one, when you're younger, you have a little more resiliency. Like you can take some risk. I'm not saying go be dangerous, but you're right. If you see that opportunity, that little sliver, like, yeah, by all means, like run through that opportunity if you can. And, and you don't want to live a life of regret, right? Like you don't want to be down the road thinking, man, I should have done this or I should have done that. Uh, or, or, you know, that's, that's, that's not going to lead to a lot of self-satisfaction. So I really do appreciate that message. Um, this, the, yeah. I mean, that's, that's how I started my business. Um, my mist cooling business that I was the first one on the NFL sidelines. Is it to, the same thing that we see today? Like, has yeah. it just spiraled out of that? So you, how do you come up with this idea? It's a great story. So I'm over about two months before training camp started in like 1990 or 91 and Palm Springs and the mist is blowing above the restaurant and all the patrons keeping everybody cool. And I, after about three margaritas, I'm going, that looks awesome. Man. <laughs> you know, we should have that on our sidelines. So I talked to the guy who came back and asked Art Shell if I could try doing this. Twice he said, get out of here. You know, don't let the door hit you in the ass. And then finally, I because I, I just believed in it so much, I hit him again. He said, all right, go ahead and set this thing up. But if it pisses anybody off, we're going to tear it down. I said, shit, I'll tear it down with you. The game started. There wasn't a breath of air, 80 degrees. It was the biggest hit of, of the game, of, of our sideline, just being blown around with hot mitt, with, with cool mist. And so it, it ended up kind of parlaying on that to horse parks and horse tracks keeping keeping horses cool keeping the the air clean keeping the flies out of their out of their stables and it just went on i got the 96 summer olympics for that um cool that off and so maybe we should have led with all the entrepreneurial stuff instead of football that's amazing but i got i gotta ask because of the time when this took place yep. i feel like there's still a mentality kind of like you know how when you have a cold weather game like some players wear like short sleeves and they, they want to make sure you know that this doesn't bother me what was there any blowback about that because no. it's like no we don't want to look soft we can handle the heat blah 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 you know no everybody loved it because it was 80 degrees it was you know there wasn't a breath of air stirring and everybody was kind of just huddled around these fans trying to get cool before they went back out. There wasn't one person that disliked it. All the coaches were just dying. They were, it was just a smash. So do you have like the patent on the first model that like you made or how, how did that, how did that roll out? Yeah, because they've been, that the whole system has been cooling chickens off since the twenties. <laughs> guys okay. would just poke holes in the hoses and just doing and so there was no patentable way to do this 
And so my thing, and along with my partner who I brought on, is just blow and go. Don't try to don't try to just get it out to as many different industries as you can. Be the leader in the smelting plant industry. Be the leader in the plastic extruder plant. Um, you know, we got them on aircraft carriers. Uh, they came looking to us like, you know, hey, do you have something that can be portable and we can put up on the decks? And, you know, they're out in the Indian Ocean. It's 110 degrees and they got this fan blowing around and got them on NASA. And then I landed in the Summer Olympics in Atlanta and it was the hottest Olympics ever. Mm. And that was, you know, it's just part of my luck. Mm. So I imagine once you get on TV like that, that's got to help your brand awareness a little bit. It, it does. But the ways that I got on, on, on the Olympics, if you got a second, it's, it's the greatest story in my book. Let's go. So about 1989, um, getting ready for the next game and a shoe salesman came in schlepping a new kind of shoe that it was brand new. Nobody had ever seen this before. Everybody had, I had Converse contract, Adidas and, you know, Puma and everything else, but I had a Converse contract and this kid's going, Hey, you know, this is, so everybody's, no one's really giving them the time of day. I find, I said, give me a shoe. What, what is this thing? And it's, it was no different than the Converse that I had. It was the exact same thing. You know, it was cleats, rubber and everything else. So I said, give them to me. I'll try them. He went back to his, his office and he got a football shoe on the, one of the Los Angeles Raiders in an NFL game. And he was like, just like the king in his company, his brand new little startup. So I retired two or three years later, and then three years later, go to the Olympics to try to get the contract to pull the Olympics. I'm going against Raytheon and GE and a lot of other big companies. I We do our little dog and pony show, come home, and I get this call. And this guy says, hey, I'm going to give you guys the Olympics because I believe in you. And I went, wait a minute, what? And long story short, he goes, you don't remember me. He goes, my name is Mike Ariano. What? I'm a shoe salesman in your locker room, and everybody treated me like shit except for you. You were the only one. You made me a hero in my company, and now it's your turn. And it was just like, wow. So he gave us the Olympics because I was cool to him seven years earlier. That's pretty badass right there. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just, and it's kind of the, some of the theme of my book, man. Treat everybody alike without looking for something and the shit just comes back to you. Yeah, that is amazing. Like, what's the odds of that? Like, just that door opening up from that all those years before. Uh, yeah. that, that's uh, that's Crazy. quite phenomenal. Crazy. Oh, all right. All right. So, Survivor. Well, right before I ask you about Survivor. Minneapolis question I wanted to ask is, is this a uh, derogatory term they use there to talk about people is cake eater a thing they say up there. Cake eater, no, no. Okay. Someone told me that before <laughs> wait, wait, and it sound made up. So that's why I wanted to ask somebody. Cake eater in Minneapolis. Yeah. There's something to, like affluent people. They call cake eaters. Oh, really? I don't know. I, 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 look, don't, don't take my word for it. I, I, I was asking because someone told me that. And I, I you're always curious what a, what a Minnesota cake eater was, huh? I'm, I'm gonna, I, I should have Googled it first, but I thought I'd just ask you. <laughs> That's all right. So let's let's go to Survivor uh, and talk a little bit about that experience because I don't know that much about the show. Like, how long were you there? And, you know, just what was the environment like? Like, once the camera stopped rolling, was everybody just, like, sitting at the Four Seasons? I don't know. How, how did this roll? No, it's it's 100% real. It's shockingly real. Um you starve. There's they don't give you anything. You don't even get a piece of gum. Everything you see on TV is real. The you know if you see someone that's a dick, they're a dick because they've been filming you nonstop, twenty four seven for a month. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's it's real. You you starve. You you lay around a lot. Um, it's uh, it's rough. I lost thirty three pounds in thirty one days. When the, show, when the show ended, I went back. I was gonna. I flew back to Los Angeles. I was gonna go see my parents in Arizona, and my front tooth was. I just had it was sore, so I went and saw my dentist. He took a X ray and he came back and just almost white, just saying, "There's more bacteria in there than I've ever seen anywhere. Oh, wow. We're gonna pull your front tooth right now." And he goes, "This kills people in third world countries because you just." The way I always described it, this this is your toilet paper. This is your toothbrush. Oh, this, wow. This, this is, yeah, I mean, you just don't have anything. You you have a pair of shorts and 
that's it. I bet that's a hell of a waiver you got to sign before you go on that show. It's exactly right. And that's why I can't really say a whole lot what's going on. I mean, the, the thing is like this, and it's actually, I think it's $5 million every time you tell something that's going on behind the scenes, but there really isn't a whole lot going on behind the scenes. It's uh, you're seeing everything, the stress and the strain and crying and everything else is all real. Would you, would you ever go back on if uh, you had the opportunity? They asked, they asked me a couple of years, two, three years later, and I just said, hell no. That, that's how brutal it is. So I saw that you got kicked off or voted out after 31 days. So what was the bigger issue for you? Was it the mental perspective or the physical perspective? Uh, um, good question. Physical, because I hadn't really eaten in a month. You know, I was just, you could, you could see my rib cage. You could count my vertebrae. Um, I went on at 250 and I walked, I got out of there at about 218. Wow. Things that's... like that. I mean, it was just uh mentally it was okay, but you're you just you're so depleted, your brain's not even working. So what did you eat while you were there? Like what were you able to actually eat? We ate thousands of termites. You know, you just like a gorilla, you break <laughs> off you break off a chunk of the, the termite nest and run a stick through your mouth and stick it in the hole and they're running all over it. You wrap your lips around it. Mm. They, they, t- they taste like peppers. It's, and it's the highest protein in the jungle. All right. So uh, you made it sound a little more appealing than what I originally thought. But, you know, in that show, you'll see the, you'll, if you, if you watch the show, um, they have the rewards of food. And so it might be chocolate cake or ribs or hamburgers or whatever. You haven't eaten, so your body's not ready for it. It's <laughs> it's it's coming out as, of you as fast as it's going in. It's it's crazy. You don't hold. You cannot hold anything down. I believe that. I, I mean, your your body has adapted to this crazy environment. And then all of a sudden, you're like, ah, for this one day, we're going to do something completely wild and different. Yeah. So yeah. where where were you at for this uh, series? Nicaragua. Nicaragua. It was 2000, 2010. Um, uh, Redemption Island, season 22. So does that mean like other castmates from the past come on? Why do they call it Redemption Island? Uh, yeah, three guys came from from old shows, Boston Rob and a couple other guys. Okay. Um, yeah. Hmm. All right. So what's the, give us the name of the book there for everyone to hear. We want to make sure we get this out there. It's Aggressively Human. That's that's a that's a sticking title. I like that. And and can they find it everywhere? I'm sure Amazon's probably a good place to go. Amazon Amazon's a great place for it. Um, go to Amazon. Aggressively human. Yeah, it's doing really well. I've got 85 stars. Um, it's uh, it's it's uh, yeah. It's just it's a great message. It's a it's a fun guys read. I think that I think actually it's being sold in about thirty thousand different sites. Um, I did the Audible. Uh, which was a lot of fun and stepping out in a different challenge that I'd never so, done. So wait, 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 you, you're, you did your audible. I recorded the audible. Yeah. I couldn't oh. have somebody else tell my story. You know, I appreciate I that, like, but I, I didn't know how that worked. If they would just be like the publisher, whoever's like, no, 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 you gotta let this guy do it. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, we just signed a little indie uh, publisher and they don't do a lot of the marketing. It's, it's, I'm kind of a one man sales and marketing uh, team right now. Yeah, we've talked to uh, authors before in the past, and that, I mean, we've had we've had one that was he wrote a book with Dan Patrick, and you know that was a little different. You, you had, uh, and he's a writer for The Simpsons, so he had a little bit better push. Yeah. But most of the guys we talk about, like, there's these really good books out there, and there it's just you peddling it, doing what you can. But you know, we'll we'll do what we can to help you out, brother. I mean, you know, we got we got our Thank socials you. out there and, and we'll make sure we put the links up there because real, real easy place is just my website too, writeauthor.com. Yeah. That, that, that's there's a hot link, hot link to uh, um, uh, Amazon. And then I've got a lot of rotating pictures, all my blogs that I've been doing for the last year. Um, tons of great photos. So what does uh, 2024 have in store for the most interesting man in the world? Uh, pumping the book, pumping the book hard. Um, get out there and get in the surf. My knee is feeling great. Um, I'm going to be going to, I just got uh, the Barnes and Noble in Santa Monica. 
uh, out here for the grand opening in the middle of June. Just going to a lot of book signings, just schlepping my book, uh, a few short little trips, um, probably this fall or something late, you know, going into winter, um, probably get a surf trip in somewhere, maybe back down to Fiji. Other than that, we, we love where we're living here. And I also, I've got a, I patented a toilet, um, kind of a wacky idea that I got when we traveled around the world for nine months. Um, Go we, on. I need to hear about this patented toilet now. Just a, a, American toilets, just toilets in general. You're sitting even when we were in Indonesia and everybody squats there and they squat and they go in a hole in the floor or something that's really lower. And that's why the squatty potties are so popular. You want, you can, it's shocking to feel the difference when you have your knee above your hips, it just opens up your colon and everything else. And it's kind of, it's kind of <laughs> I believe crazy, that but, but this, there's, 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 this is the angle, cool. man. This is the content we needed for the show, but I, is, it all makes sense to me, but I don't know how well that translates to the American culture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to really start schlepping that to uh, about 30 different big manufacturers, total standard, um, you know, night, night. Uh, do you, do you got a name for it? Um, yeah, but they'll do something else. I call it the courtesy 180. And so you, spit, <laughs> and so you know, you know, when you walk into a bathroom and the in the public bathroom stinks, you say, "Ah, what a courtesy flush." Yeah. So this one, you you spin around and you face the tank, and now the flusher's right there. Your toilet paper's right there. You can put your stuff on top of the tank. The ramps, the squatty potty is built up on the sides. They're ramps, so a long leg up to a short leg. The toilet seat instead of being about three and a half inches it's about four and a half inches so there's a whole lot more room for for big dairy airs um, it's also <laughs> so, so little so kids won't fall in and they have to put another seat on it there's handles up on the up on the front of it to help an old person or a handicapped person it's, it's ada compliant so a wheelchair can roll up to it and they can slide right onto it it always killed me watching people you know wheel up in a wheelchair and they're hanging out to it and they're wobbling all over and it's just like Ugh. i guess new meaning to the old shit handle don't it <laughs> it might uh, yeah. you know I, I try to convince people that you're supposed to sit on toilets backwards anyway because that's what the tank's for you can like put your magazine down and read but there is <laughs> I, you're, you're hey, not why all. not I, you know what I, that's my patent <laughs> that's it um well, Steve, I, I tell you what, brother, it's been, yeah. It, it, yeah, it's a, hey, it's that West Virginia internet connection we got, but I, I just wanted to say, man, it's been a blast talking to you. Uh, I mean, just the stories are amazing. The book sounds fantastic because just the conversations, I, I just got to decide if I want to do the audible or actually read it because uh, you do a good job telling it. So don't let anybody tell you different, but man, it's, it's been a blast. We loved having you on the show today, man. Thank you, man. I, I really appreciate it. You guys made it fun and easy and uh, really enjoyable. I see the Raider helmet back there on the, on the stand too. Yeah. Nice it's, job. Uh, Greg is a big uh, Raiders fan. We got, we got some, we got like a sign, Jeff Hostetler, you know, West Virginia connection. So we got a uh, Hostetler here. Right. He's got the flag. He's got the helmet. Yeah. Greg's a big Raiders fan. Beautiful. That, that's where my heart is. They're bringing that's us, right. you know, if you've always heard once a Raider, always a Raider. They bring us back. The Cowboys have never brought me back once. The Indianapolis Colts just brought us all back, the 40th reunion guys. I was with them from Baltimore to Indy. So they brought all of us back, the whole team. But the Raiders bring all of us back. They fly us back. They put us up in a hotel for three nights, take care of all the food and drinks in the bars. Um, now they're bringing us back in the middle of June for a three-day first-time wellness weekend. And they're going to have all kinds of doctors there checking from head to toe. Oh, wow. They don't have to, they don't have to do this. I, I fully believe there's certain teams in sports that we need to do well. And I feel like the Raiders are one of those teams because they have all that nostalgia. They have the camaraderie among the players, the former, the alum, and all that. There's an identity with that franchise. We're, we're going on almost 25 years since the Raiders have been a good football team. Yeah. It's been, it's been some dark times, but – my God, it's good for the league when they're doing well. Well, and yeah. I'm impressed with everything you just said. Like, if you look at all the owners, uh, Mark Davis is the next to last or the lowest as far as like Mark's net worth. Yeah. But yet here we are. We're not, it's not going to stop us from doing all this stuff. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, man. What he puts out. Yeah. It's just going to be expensive three days for him for, 
you know, just seeing, just taking care of his boys. Yeah, but hey, that that helps. Cool. That 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 helps with the product. Like if you're recruiting free agents and whatnot, see how you take care super, of the players that aren't even classy. here now. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Super classy. Awesome. All right, brother. Well, hey, we'll let you go. Enjoy that uh, SoCal weather while you got it. I don't know yeah. uh, how it is there, but it's uh, it's about eight o'clock here on the East Coast, and it's forty eight degrees. So, uh, and Greg, pleasure, man. Nice, nice to nice to meet you both. Enjoy the time. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. It's been a pleasure.